Thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, my name is Dave Kofranek. I live in Eugene. I've lived there a long time, but uh, I've been working in off and on in Southern Oregon for the last 20 years, since 2002. I went to school at Humboldt, also in the state of Jefferson. So um, I feel like I have some real familiarity, maybe even some roots here, uh, a lot of experience in the area. Um, it's really special to me. Thanks for having me. Um, I can't see anything. <laughs> it's all right. I got it memorized. Uh, uh, it's all right. It's a dinner. Okay. Oh, well, well kind of. A little bit better? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. All right. I hope to do five things today. I hope to, uh, hope that we learn what a bryophyte and a lichen are. We're gonna be exposed to the diversity of those organisms, see and learn about rare and uncommon species in the area, travel across Southwest Oregon, and have some fun. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, so it is. You figured it out, okay. Okay, bryophytes are the earliest land plants. Yes, period. They, they don't have a true vascular system like um, flowering plants do. So they're often known as them and lichens are often known as non-vascular plants. Lichens aren't plants, but um, so sometimes I'm re I refer to myself as a non-vascular botanist. <clears throat> there are three types of these plants, uh, three, types, three types of bryophytes. That, there are three organisms that make up bryophytes, mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. So I, I think for now, we all probably have a good idea what a moss is. Liverworts, there's two kinds. There's a leafy liverwort and a thallus liverwort. The top one of the liverworts there, that's leafy. It's not the best example of that it's leafy. The leaves are so overlapping so tightly, you can't see it, it just looks like a bunch of worms, but um, they are leafy. We'll see more of that one later. And then below that is the thallus liverwort. That's more of a strap-like plant body. And then we have hornworts, and we're gonna spend a little time on hornworts right here, right now, because we won't see them later. Uh, there aren't as many hornworts. There's only maybe a dozen in the state, probably less. This is our rare one here, Phymatoceros bulbiculosis. Um, it also kind of have a, has a strap-like body, like a thallus liverwort, but the, you can see why they're called hornworts. So that's the sporophyte, that's the spore-bearing reproductive structure, it looks like a horn, and that'll split down the length longitudinally, and as it matures, the spores will come out, and uh, right off the bat, or in the field, you could see that it either has yellow spores or black spores, it's like a first key in the, first couplet in the key. Um, and then this particular species has these, see these pale spots? Those are basically tubers and they hang down below the thallus and you know, eventually plant themselves and a new plant will, will grow from those. So, um, but there is a lookalike. So if you see those, those tuber-like things, um, you gotta rule out the lookalike. Oh, and then back to mosses. Mosses, there are, you can break them down real quickly to five different general groups. There's an acrocarpus moss that just grows upright. And then the sporophyte, the spore bearing part, would just come right out of the top of the stem. Then there's a pleurocarpus uh, moss. And you might see these in the forest, the feather mosses that creep along the forest floor. And that would be pleurocarpus. And they grow their spore bearing structures off to the side. And then some mosses have a midrib in the leaf and some mosses don't. So those four characteristics, you can divide up all mosses real quick on those four characteristics. We'll see examples of those later. And to the lichens. Um, you may know that lichens are a symbiotic organism or symbiotic association among um, two or up to four organisms, kind of like a mini ecosystem. There's something that photosynthesizes for the lichen, um, usually a green algae, a, a single cell green algae. 
species, and then it's kind of housed within some fungal tissue. It can also, there can also be some cyanobacteria mixed in there. Um, that, that would be the photosynthetic partner. And recently, uh, there was a big discovery that yeast is involved too. Um, that was discovered just because we finally, our technology was able to pick up on it finally. So that was a big breakthrough. That made it into uh, the journal Science or something like that. There are three forms of lichens. Folios, that kind of has a top and bottom, um, kind of broad and flat. And fruticose at the bottom, shrubby, stringy. And then crustose, it just looks like crust on a rock or in a tree, kind of sometimes very subtle, just like some faded paint. I thought it'd be fun. I cut a lichen open and I cut open a vascular plant. Uh, these are, no, um, these are. okay. <laughs> um, cross sec thin cross sections of these things. Uh, this is um, organ grape on the right, Berberus nervosa. And on the left is uh, the folios lichen you saw earlier. And I just wanted to show this kind of organization within it and see these uh, lichen partners in action. On the left is, um, there's a, on the top layer, there's a, kind of a dense layer of fungal tissue. And then below that, you see this um, single cell uh, green algae distributed throughout, kind of close to the top, you know, get closer to the sun that way. And then below it's kind of some loose hyphae, loose um, fungus tissue. Kind of, kind of similar to the, on the right, there's a lot of chloroplasts up on top of the leaf there. And then down below, it's kind of looser, more airspace for that gas, uh, gas exchange, um, for the me metabolism of, of photosynthesizing. So there's kind of a convergent strategy going on there. I thought that was interesting. Does the lichen have anything like Shimano? No. Well, that, that's interesting. There are thin spots in the cortex, they would say. So some of these, actually, maybe we can go back. Yes. If the one on the left, the white spots, those would be thin spots. Um, so maybe there's some gas exchange going through that. Mosses have stomata, we'll see some. Okay, our first stop is Table Rocks. It's way back in 2005. And I took a picture of a, a picture that I took with the camera way back then as point and shoot. And it's, it's just so funny that, I don't know. I, um, I mean, we have cell phones now and they have cameras on them and they have apps to load your data into. And then this is such a, it was another time way back then. So I took a picture of a picture just to kind of date this, this, this subject. But, but these are the highlights on the left. Um, we'll see some of these. Um, there's the first three or four were state first or seconds. That was exciting. Oh, and then I, I'm sure we've all been up to the top of Table Rocks, but the um, the vernal pools and the mount, the low mounds, it, the whole thing kind of undulates real subtly. Uh, but the plants, including these non-vascular plants, really respond to that. They'll kind of some will like to grow closer to the water, some farther away, stuff like that. So on Tostadon Californicus, I think this was the second for the state that we that I found up there. Um, Acrocarpus moss, see the upright? It, the, those are uh, the capsules, the spore-bearing parts coming out of the top of the stem. Typical looking leaf down on the left, there's the midrib. So it'd be a costate acrocarpus moss. Those cells are kind of large and the cell walls are kind of thin. So you'd say that was a lax cellular areolation as opposed to smaller cells with thicker walls. And here's our stomata. And uh, do you notice anything unique about it? I don't know if the photograph's good enough, but the stomata are in the capsule and vascular plants have, I think, I believe those are guard cells. I didn't brush up on this, two guard cells. This has got one, it's like a donut. 
<laughs> it's pretty neat. I'm not sure how effective that is, uh, how the donut closes and opens, but kind of a unique thing for the for that whole family, the funerary AC. And this was right up there um, on Table Rocks too, Campylopus subulatus, uh, and a uh, long, skinny, narrow-leaved acrocarpus moss with, and then this, this uh, midrib is exceptionally wide. Here it is on the upper right. That dark band, vertical dark band is the midrib. It almost takes up the whole breadth of the leaf lamina. And it's a little confusing when you look at it with your hand lens in the field because you have to kind of remember that that whole thing's the costa and not just the, the leaf lamina. Here's a cross section on the lower right. Um, so those cells of the costa of the midrib are thin walled and real big. So it kind of looks like celery or something in a way, colenchyma cells, uh, real lacy, beautiful. We don't have too many species or, or other similar species that do that or look like that. And so that was special. And then um, this species, will grow in kind of tight tufts up on Table Rock or wherever it is. And if you draw your finger across it, these little fascicles of leaves, do you see them laying about on top? Bunches of leaves, they'll kind of just pop off. And then of course they go on and propagate themselves to the whole new, make a whole new tuft of Antilopus. So that's, that's a neat field ID trick. <laughs> Um, another one that was, this one was new to the state. It's on, in the crevices of the basalt, the, of the columnar basalt of the table rock wall, sides of the table rocks. And this is Orthotricum philanderi. Um, Orthotricum is a really big, uh, diverse genus. They divided it up into two, two genera now, but anyway, it's really diverse. So I find it really interesting. Um, the unique thing about this is that it's leaf lamina. Most mosses, their leaf lamina is one cell thick, all just one cell thick. This one is two cells thick. On the left, well, these are both cross sections of the leaf lamina. Um, yeah, and then the little bumps, those are papillae, just some texture on the leaf surface. I thought that it, the 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 double layer cells of the leaves gives the leaf a um, more rigid appearance. And I think that this kind of almost looks like Selaginella. It doesn't look like most um, mosses, I thought, seeing in the field. Oh, and then another hot spot. Also, um, this was 2006, I think. So these are photos of photos. <laughs> um, these are the highlights of that area that I was working on. There was cal uh, cal uh, calcareous rock there. And um, I love it down here because there's a lot, I don't know about a lot, but a certain amount of calcareous rock. And it, calcareous rock is kind of uncommon in general throughout the greater Northwest, including Washington, I think. And um, so whenever you come across calcareous rock, there's these calcicles or calcifiles there and, and they're rare and it gets really exciting. Or at least I get excited. And uh, so that's what that's why some of these that's why there were so many of these rares that showed up here. Um, one of these was another orthotricum and is also has a bistratos leaf lamina. Um, kind of a coincidence, but it's true. Um, and then these papillae, the ornamentation on the surface of them is, is really um, dense and forked and uh, numerous. And what this does, you know, kind of uh, arm's length away is it, 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 it catch, it does something with the light. It doesn't reflect the light. It makes it look really dull, so dull that it looks cloudless or bluish. And that's what's causing that color of the habit of the moss. This one is on Pompadour Bluff. There's a couple of field trips there. <clears throat> um, this is also the same species, but just some informational things about the, the capsule, the sporophyte. 
Um, there's ribs on the cap capsules. There's the eight long ones and eight short ones. These are just some exposing you to some morphological diversity. Uh, teeth, a lot of capsules have teeth, of course. Uh, then there's all kinds of variations of teeth. These are a little more on the simple side. And here's another stomata. And the species that grow in more drier areas, you can't really see the stomata actually, but there's um, these surrounding cells that kind of overarch it. And I think it reduces uh, um, evaporation. And the lichen there, another state first was um, Umbilicaria hirsuta. <clears throat> And the genus Umbilicaria, these, it's a folios lichen, you know, top, bottom, broad. Um, it's attached at one single point, like an umbilicus, an umbilical cord. And, um, and then the hirsuta comes from the fuzzy undersurface, which is a tomentum kind of risings, or yeah, risings, and, and which isn't unique necessarily for Umbilicaria, but the lower left picture is, and that's ceridia, that, that rough texture and eventually some of that will some of those bumps will erode off and it's not the best example but it's it's special for this genus and they'll rub off and it's another vegetative propagule i mean what do you need to start a lichen you need just the basics you need a little bit of fungus and a, and a photobiont and an algae or something so that ceridia is just <clears throat> a cluster of fungal hyphae and some algae in it and it gets blown away and if it likes where it lands it starts growing a new one and there's different variations of these things we'll we'll see um this was also there um another calcareous species that likes seeps um this is a gelatinous lichen so this is one that has cyanobacteria instead of green algae and that's why it's dark and it's not stratified like that early picture we saw that of the thin microscopic section where those those nice layers with the green algae in there. This is just a mixture of fungal hyphae and cyanobacteria chains, and but it's really airy in there, a lot of room, a lot of space. And when it gets wet, it fills up and it just swells up. All that space fills up with water and. They call these jelly lichens, so you can, when you poke them, they feel somewhat gelatinous. They're pretty neat, and they're really diverse. Um, a lot of exciting discoveries out there. Wait, is that a moss or a lichen? It's a lichen, yeah. <clears throat> um, the bumps, that kind of bumpy texture in the middle or most of that area, that's another propagule. It's like ceridia, but this one has a cortex over it. Kind of a layer of, of organized dense cells over it and then those can be potentially rubbed off and and disperse and grow and grow a new one this is a acrocarpus moss uh with the midrib there this is didymodon norisii dan norris was a professor of biology at humboldt state university uh right before my time unfortunately I did, um, but this was named after him. And it likes this sheet drainage habitat in the top left. It's kind of just low sloping rock slabs coming down like this. And it really responds to that. And all these little green tufts on the top, top right are really colonizing that, that rock slab habitat. The lower left, beautiful picture and color, but more often than not, I see it like the color of the leaf there, the reddish brown. That must be new growth, the green one. In the lower right are cross sections. There's a lot of information you can get about a moss um, doing cross sections of the leaf. How many layers thick the leaves are, that, that mid rib, the cross section, the round part in the middle. <clears throat> There's two, three different cell types right there. And this is a lichen, this is a fruticose lichen, um, stringy. Um, the specimen in the bottom right here is about uh, five or six inches tall. Um, you've probably seen this before. Some, it, it looks like a really common genus, Briaria, that's called horsehair lichen. 
Um, this one is different though. It, it can get purplish or mauve or brown, but it, that purple or mauve, mauve color is really unique. And then up close, the top photo has got these elongate spiraling pseudocyphelae. So these are kind of breaks in the cortex that might um, have that gas exchange purpose. <laughs> uh, this is a dung moss. There's a whole family of dung mosses. Um, they're usually a more Northern um, better represented in the north, like Alaska and, and stuff like that. Um, they like nitri uh, nitrogen rich substrates, uh, dung or animal remains, bones, antlers. Um, it's it's fun but exciting. So they're kind of rare. Um, this one was found found this one east of Butte Falls, where it's a little bit colder and maybe higher up in the winter, colder in the winter maybe. Um, um, and it was found on cow pies, um, you know, up north in Alaska, they they grow on giant piles of, uh, uh, moose dung. And, but down here, they, I guess cow pie was a good, uh, substitute. Um, so that was exciting. And then I went, you know, I, so I stumbled across this, um, Cow pie, and I saw moss on it, but it could have been some weedy species of moss. But I, I took a closer look and I saw a capsule, and the capsule had an exerted columella. See that apple core looking thing sticking out of the, the urn? I got really excited about that <laughs> because that's that's something that only happens in this family. Um, so that was, I don't know, that was an exciting moment. And then we found a lot more after that. Um, Serrata or serrata, serrata. Uh, it's got a serrate leaf margin that gives it its name. A um, little bit more north, even in Eugene, the greater Eugene area, um, on ridges and stuff, this will grow on coyote dung. So already up there, the climate is a little bit cool enough that it doesn't need a big pile of dung like a cow pie, because a cow pie is kind of acting like a log. It can, it can retain a lot of moisture. And since it's hotter and warmer down here and drier, um, it can last down here. But up there, it doesn't need to as much, so it can get by on a smaller piece of dung. So it's unique. <laughs> Here's another umbilicaria. Um, this one is kind of new on our radar, relatively speaking, 10 or 20 years ago. Um, it's, I don't, know, I don't know when it was first seen, but anyway, it, 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 it's very closely related to one that's very common that's just plain brown. And then people started seeing this red one and got really excited. So, so far it's just at the variety level, as you see, Umbilicaria thea, variety coccinia. Um, maybe it'll become a, a species at some point. But, um, there's no mistaking it, it's beautiful. And here's a moss, um, Acrocarpus uh, costate moss, um, getting a little out of range here, Douglas County, but I, I couldn't resist. Um, I, I got so excited when I saw this. This is up, yeah, Quines Creek, um, up on a pretty high up, God, almost 4,000 feet, um, but a lot of fog swept by there. So it was kind of humid and cool a lot. And so that's how, again, this is like a Northern species. So I was really surprised to see it. And there's a million things that have narrow leaves that are narrow curly leaves that grow on rock. And I love them all, but I was really excited to see this one because it's so nondescript and I recognize it. I just didn't pass it off as, as something else. So I was kind of gave myself a pat on the back for not passing that one because I've only seen that twice, three times in the state. It's, that's Exciting. Oh, okay. And this is just some <clears throat> details of that same species. Yeah, different views. This Michael Luth, his photos, this is on the internet. Anybody can find them. Uh, he's a German bryologist, a photographer extraordinaire. It's all available for anybody. 
Um, and I think in North America, two thirds of our species overlap with European ones as far as mosses go. So it's really helpful to, if you key something out, I, I usually go straight here and see if it matches. <clears throat> All right, Perella berlanderi is our leafy liverwort representative. Um, it's down here, but I, I've only seen as far south as Douglas County. So it's got two, actually you could say it's complinate. It's kind of a um, top bottom oriented. And then it, it's got two leaves that grow out of the side. And then you flip, if you flip it over on the lower right, the lower left corner, that's, we're looking at the bottom there. And then you see some more flaps going on. And what those are the two lobules. So below the two leaves are two smaller leaves tucked in near the, the stem. And then on the stem in the middle is an underleaf. So there's like per segment or per node would be five leaf-like structures. Um, so that's pretty neat. We have about four species in the state. This is our only rare one. Or there was another one, but it might've burned up. Um, I guess that, that so bryophytes don't really have a vascular system, but they come up with these clever ways of retaining water. And I think that all these flaps of leaf can catch and hold water longer. Same with the papillae, you know, that leaf surface, you know, it retains a layer of water. So are these also in Europe? Some of them, not this species. Um, are most of our species? Also in Europe? It's, uh, in general, two thirds, but this is also Southwest Oregon and you know the Klamath knot. And, and so Europe doesn't have, I mean, there's a lot of endemics right here. So um, excluding those, there are, we do have share a lot with them. They're so old that they've had so much time to colonize the world. Um, and that's why, so many countries or continents share so much with each other, these, these species. Southern hemisphere is another world. They kind of don't go, they're just unrelated down there, but it's Northern hemisphere. Then we Don Californicus, um, another narrow leaf <laughs> uh, moss. Um, this is um, in the Podiaceae. I, I love that family. It's they have a lot of papillae and they're really, um, they, they grow in calcareous um, substrates and uh, they're really diverse, especially at the genus level. So I really love that family. This one was um, so this Lake Creek east of Eagle Point, growing in a couple of different situations. The left is kind of a, a broad ridge in uh, a saddle sort of. So it's, it's kind of receiving some Maybe a little bit of snow melt, but definitely some surface drainage from just that surrounding grassland. And then lower right here in a, a swale or a, a seasonal stream on a rock. So it needs a little bit of a little bit of moisture, not a whole bunch. And then this is from the uh, the paper describing the species in 2014. So it hasn't been formally known for very long. Um, yeah, you get some idea of the cellular types. It's kind of unusual, unlike the rest of the members of the genus and these lower, the lowest two photographs in that um, they don't have these small cells in the costa in the uh, midrib and they, they're lacking the papillae, but um, so that makes it unique. And this is Tripterocladium leucocladulum. Um, just rolls right off the tongue. Lake Creek, Lake Creek area, okay, same area, east of Eagle Point. Um, this used to be on the rare list. It's not anymore, but I still think it's uncommon. This is our um, representative of a, a ecostate pleurocarpus moss. So this would be a, a moss that kind of sprawls along the ground. It looks a little more upright in this photograph, but in theory, it sprawls along the ground and the leaves do not have a midrib. 
And this is really pretty thin and wiry, this species. Uh, the leaves are probably less than a millimeter and uh, real strict against the stem. So this whole leafy shoot is not very wide either, but it grows in these masses. And so from a distance, um, for out of the corner of your eye would just kind of look like some fuzz, whereas <clears throat> some other species would have some uh, more texture or more of some character that you might recognize, but this just looks like fuzz. It's a uh, endemic to Northwest North America, probably Idaho is as far east as it goes. I don't know, it probably goes into Washington, but not north of there. Uh, Pseudoleskila serpentinensis. This is also a plur pleurocarpus moss, has a costa midrib. Um, this was described by Dan Norris uh, from HSU and his grad student. Um, likes serpentine rocks. Um, and I hear that in more exposed situations, it gets to real kind of maroon or bronze or rusty color. So it sounds beautiful. I was going to say something more about that. Okay. Oh, this is what my wife thinks I do out there. <laughs> Looks like she's right. <laughs> oh, and then I was sent to an oak woodland. I never get sent to an oak woodland. Um, this was a great treat. Um, yeah. And the local color. Some comfort food for you. Love the Arctostaphylos, that, that contrasting color. I had never seen that milkweed before. And this was there, our uh, Thalos liverwort example, uh, Asterella philanderi. Um, there's maybe 10 species of Asterella in our state. Um, they're, they're, this is, I timed it, I just got lucky. These are the sporophytes, the spore bearing structures there. Um, usually you come across them and they don't have that. And it's like, well, you, then you can't really identify it. But this one you, you could potentially, fortunately, because these lobes, they're so long. Right here, right here, that's really long. Usually Asterella lobes are this long. But there's many of them, but these are really elongated. So that's that's really convenient. So how long do those reproductive structures last? Um he's got a couple of months maybe. They take a while to mature. And it's probably less than a couple of months. Well, the um, the the, um, the plant body itself, the vegetative part, is perennial, um, but the but annually, it, yeah, yeah. And then this species was in that oak woodland too, Torchula leucostoma. Um, it's supposed to be an Arctic alpine species, but it was in this low uh, oak woodland. Um, there were other records of it coming from low elevations, so that made me feel better, but um, I think something's going on there, but um, I mean, maybe someone could split it. I think that might be a clue that a cryptic species, they would call it. Um, but this, this photo is just an example of, this is also the party AC, um, just a lot, lots, lots to look at, a lot of different types of cells, the pili, a hair point, recurved margins, and uh, I took a picture of the capsule. Um, one winter I got really extra nerdy and I refurbished an old German uh, microscope from the 50s. And just, a, I mean, a precision, I talk about a precision instrument, you know, from Germany from the 50s. The thing weighs 100 pounds, it's all steel and a uh, beautiful piece of equipment. And uh, I put a filter in it, real simple, and it came out that it used 
and they captured this black field image of the capsule. And leukostoma means white mouth. So I, there's the white mouth that, that would look neat against in black field. And then I went to a quarry, I was sent to a quarry, um, thought it would be, it was just, just a few acres big um, on the map, thought it would be mostly weeds and a few natives. <laughs> and I got there and, and these were there, there's some good energy there. <laughs> and uh, then I started poking around and all these calcifiles started turning up. Uh, rare species, and I got really excited, and all of a sudden, this thing that should have taken one afternoon turned into almost two days. Um, but we got more orthotricum and a gymnostomum. The orthotricum, orthotricum, orthotricum cupulatum. Um, this is more better represented on the east side. Still not that common on the east side, but. Which quarry is that? Or it's outside of Williams. Outside? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know. I think it's marble. Okay. Um, yeah. Some good close up of that. And then this lichen was uh, growing right with that orthotricum on this, on this boulder. A Lithagrium undulatum, also a calci calcifile. This photo on the top right is lightened so you could see detail. Otherwise, it's just black and dark, uh, but exciting because it's a calcifile and I don't run into them very often. And then on the approach to the quarry, or right at the foot of the quarry, it's broad um, landing and it's just crushed marble gravel. And as you can see in the lower right here, and you know, thin grass, and then this maroon stuff, and it's all barbula unguiculata, which is rare. Um, so that was exciting. Um, God, probably hundreds of square meters of it. And um, the dominant thing growing right there, and they probably get some ponding, you know, in the winter, maybe under a half inch of water at times for a while. And then, uh, and, and so that species, when it dries, it curls, it very neatly curls its leaves around the stem. And so it's pretty easy to identify in the field. Um, and then I was seeing something similar, but different. And it's the other species that does this, that I see just as seldom. And it was really confusing, but just exciting once I find, finally ironed it out and saw there were two things here. But it's one on the top right was much less prevalent there. Uh, Pseudocrossidium horns chuchianum. Um, that one, I've also, it's only made four records for the state. One's up Sampson Creek, is that by um, Immigrant Lake or something? Yeah. So that was exciting. And here's some close-ups of that. Pseudocrossidium horns chuchianum. Uh, look at on the lower right, not just recurved leaf margins, but revolute leaf margins. Another way you got some, it might retain some water once it got saturated. And they also mentioned something about does act like almost specialized photosynthetic organs. That whole margin is kind of like a tube. I'm not sure how that works, but that's what people have alluded to. Oh, and then this was an interesting project. Um, I tried to, uh, or I wanted, I got to um, survey high coastal peaks and some of, there's some very rare bryophytes and lichens um, on high coastal peaks up north, at least Saddle Mountain up uh, near um, Portland or in the very Northwest corner of the state. And, uh, and it acts like a Southeast Alaskan island, really, because it's it's not surrounded by water, but it's tall and and therefore cold because of the elevation. And then it's right on the coast, so it gets a lot of humidity. So it kind of acts like a what edaphic uh, Southeast Alaska island. So I wanted to see how far that pattern um, 
continued down our coast. And um, it didn't, it looked, things were really different down here on the coast, but there were still really interesting things. So these are two um, Arctic alpine lichens. We got a folios one on the left, the Melanelia hepatazon, which is common in Alaska, but, and maybe it's, yeah, it's in the mountains around here, maybe, but on the coast, I, no one would, I don't think anyone would expect that. I certainly didn't. And then the top right, a Pruticos species, uh, Ceocolon aculeatum, um, a Pruticos. So in Alaska, there's Pruticos things on the ground. Around here, it's just on the trees. But on the ground, things got to be really cool and humid for something Pruticos to grow on the ground. And this was. So that was really interesting to see. This is outside Gold Beach. Yeah, 3,500 feet and seven miles from the ocean. That's a nice combination. And this was in the coastal uh, mountains too, but this is um, it, uh, this is all around here also. Um, it took me a while to figure what was what this was and what's going on, but you see a nice slab of serpentine rock. It's that beautiful blue green color. And then these mo purple moss patches on it. And it's this, Didymodon nicholsonii. And um, um, someone once said, and I don't know if, I'm curious what you, you vascular folks would think about this, but some, it's, things aren't necessarily serpentine restricted as, as far as mosses go, but they can handle it. So that's why they end up there. <laughs> Is that it? Maybe they, maybe they get outcompeted somewhere else. So they just uh, resort to, to serpentine. Um, that's that might be what's going on with the species. I've, I've lost all track of time. I hope I'm not going over. I'm sorry. This is our last slide. Um, uh, part of the same project, high coastal peaks. Um, on the left, Cytinium platinum, um, a big jelly lichen with lobules. We've we've learned about Ceridia, Isidia. Now lobules, which is kind of a compressed isidia or a very small lobule. Again, it just detaches and grows again. And then the lower right uh, is a leafy liverwort. Unfortunately, I um, can't really see the leaves. These leaves are really neat. Um, they got two or three lobes, but off the lobes are the cilia. And so it looks really fuzzy. And this will show up. Uh, you hike east up into the Cascades, and um, at 3,000 feet, you'll start to see this on the tree basis. And uh, it's not not rare or anything, but I was it always makes me smile. Um, but on the coast, it's much less expected, and then on the south coast, I even that much it's more or less expected. So that was exciting. That's it. Thank you for coming. There isn't any questions in the Zoom yet, um, but I can remind folks to do that. And if anyone has any questions here, we do have 23 people zooming in. How exciting. From Bend to Bandon to Montague to Klamath Falls and Grants Pass. And yeah, so it's really nice that we can offer this and share. People like Dave, it's the world. Wow. Um, Glad I didn't know that before. <laughs> well, he's not that far. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if anyone has any questions, and if you don't mind repeating it for the Zoom people, because they might not be able oh, to hear. Okay. <clears throat> mosses, dung mosses. How do they find their posts? I think there's stores all over the place. Uh, good question. And if I had more time, I'd go on. All these other things have backstories too. Uh, how 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 do the dung moss spores find the next dung? Um, it's flies. Um, so it's uh, the flies are all over the dung, dung. They crawl up all over the moss, and then the spores are sticky. And they maybe they smell. Maybe that sporophyte smells too. I don't. You know. I don't know. Uh, yeah. So that's ingenious of them. Yes. Where do you find hornworts around here? Where do we find hornworts? Um, they're kind of spotty. They can be really 
prolific in places. I guess moist road cuts, I've seen them on um, like a tip up mound where a big tree tips up. Excuse me, they like a cool and moist. I, it probably depends on the species. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna probably end up giving you a very specific answer. In Eugene, there's wetlands, just these flat wetlands that get inundated in the, in the winter and dry out in the summer, and, and there's one there. Um, Roadsides, some of them. Are they rare? Not really, just that one species. Yeah, I think they like, for the most part, mineral soil that's damp most of the year. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, Vanessa, go ahead. I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about Yeah, okay. Um, oh, thanks. Um, uh, my scope situation. Um, I'll start rambling, and if I'm not answering your question, you can tell me. Um, um, I've got two nice scopes, um, and I use them frequently. Uh, this is a it's it, this is a, a a nicely balanced field. There's a lot of hard field work, enjoyable field work, but then there's this whole other side that's uh, with the scopes and with literature, and there's a whole biological and lichenological language. Um, um, yeah, it's just a whole nother world. I really enjoy it. Um, and I accumulated some scopes too, um, you know, before I upgraded. So I kept my older scopes and, and got a good box. So I actually take those uh, in the field, not in the field, but in my camper with me when I when I go working. If I need to look at something, I'll, I'll get that out. But um, yeah, that's, is, is that answer your question? Um, I guess I'm curious. More specific which scopes you recommend for like, people getting Okay. Um, yeah, I should have explained. So it's good to have a dissecting scope and a compound microscope. Um, the dissecting scope, that may be all you need for lichens um, until you get into spores, but uh, for most of the lichens, just a nice dissecting scope. Um, and those, you don't really need, if you're just getting into it, you're not really sure you want to invest. You don't really need an expensive one, but as much light as you can get is good. And now these LED ring lights are 20 bucks or something. So that's um, a really fortunate thing. Uh, more light, the better. And then the compound scope, um, it's hard to say what, it, it just depends on what your price bracket is. I mean, yeah, you could spend as much as you want to on them, but um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I did look into it and I do have a spreadsheet of, um, well, there are four major brands, Nikon, Leica, Zeiss, and Olympus. Those are the four best brands, but you're gonna pay some money, but they, you know what? They probably have student versions of those. Um, that aren't too, too, as opposed to clinical or professional or something like that versions. So yeah, those are the four, Nikon, Zeiss, Leica, Olympus. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's a, a light actually down on, on here. It's a fluorescent yellow green. Uh -huh. uh, do you know anything about its toxicity or because I, I was in uh, fertile mess rocks, the land fertile mess for years, and someone said, I want to sell you some boosting, it, and they sent me a box of this, this grind. And I called and said, Do you want to? Anyway, I, my understanding is it's toxic. Yeah. Um, it's, um, I, it's probably Letharia. Um, Volpine, Volpine, it's been a while since I said that one, Vol, Volpine or Letharia um, columbiana, or there's a third species, but the Volpine is the most, um, it, it's the really bushy one, I think, uh, the most common one. So Volp means wolf in Latin or something. And so it's called a wolf lichen because old ranchers or whoever used to get a bunch of that lichen, it's got volpic acid in it or something. 
and um, stuff a carcass with it and poison wolves with it. Wow. Um, so I, I hopefully you could Google that and find the, the exact acid that, but it's vul, vulpinic acid, I think is it, that's it. Yeah. Beautiful, but yeah, don't eat too much of it <laughs> <laughs> or any of it, but yeah. In, yeah. in that larger one, that's uh, there's a lot of that on uh, Shasta. Yeah, yeah, and then and uh, ten years ago or something, they split that one. They realized there was a second species. Um, that's all I know about that. I haven't, I haven't held each one in my hand before. So. Yeah. Yes. Um, this is really elementary. Maybe you said something that. But in comparing lichens, do you ever have the same fungus with two different algae? <clears throat> two different what? Algae. Um, or is there always, you know, the same? Is it always the same pair together? That's an excellent question, and I, if I had more time, I would have brought. I, maybe I should have brought it up anyway. Um, so the species of a lichen is actually. Um, appointed to the fungus of that lichen. That's what's unique. That the photobionts, the algae, the cyanobacteria, they, they get shared among species. Um, but so it's the, the fungus that is named. Yeah, that's unique. Okay. Yeah. So then when you say about one lichen being closely related to another, that's referring to the fungal component? Yeah, 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 that's... I guess so. <laughs> now we're getting into sequencing, and I like what part do they sequence? Um, <laughs> uh, the discomycetes, um, the disc like or fungus, um, ninety nine percent of them are because the fruiting bodies look like a disc. Um, ascos, that's what. I, or yeah, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Ascomycetes. Um, but we just said. Yeah, the cup-shaped fruiting body. There are some um, Basidiomycetes uh, fun, uh, lichens, but they look they look like a mushroom, and they're not uncommon in, on a moist log somewhere. It looks like a, a pale mushroom with decurrent gills, and then the the wood that it's attached to will be um, have a thin layer of green algae. So uh, there's a there's a microbiome there's a sample thing. Yes, and some. So would they be like almost a mycorrhizal? It's parasitic. Par oh, parasitic. They're leaching off the algae. That's true. That's yeah, like it. They're being nice to the algae, giving them a place to live. Yeah, that yeah. was, that was a little Yeah. They're so parasitic. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Sucking the juice out of the algae. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they do absorb things from the atmosphere for better or for worse. Uh, so they're used for pollution monitoring. Um, but, but they, 99% of them don't do anything say to a host tree because that wouldn't be in their best in interest. So they're not, people think they, they are like, when a tree dies, the leaves fall off and then they see all these lichens and they go, oh, the lichens killed my tree. Um, but that's, no, the lichens were always, were always there. Um, we just see them now. Yeah. The old name, uh, stick the common area, the name I think is Bulgaria common area. Uh -huh. uh, that's a local, local one. Okay. Yes. Okay. One of the interesting things is fear of falling and hanging trees. Fear of falling? Yeah. So they, they would treat fear of falling with that lichen. 
Uh, what mod? Oh, um, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, um. <clears throat> Uh, well, I'm just, uh, I always look at them and I'm just looking at green spongy things and I'm thinking, oh, that's probably right. Yeah, I guess, I guess most of them are, you know, they're that single cell layer thick. Uh, so that's really thin and not uh, like a, a club moss uh, that would be thicker. Um, yeah. Um, so, do, would you recommend a good field guide? I mean, macro micro is going on for a long time. Uh, that's that's the Bible. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. The names the Bible? Uh, uh, Lichens of the Pacific Northwest by Bruce McKean and Linda Geyser. Um, um, the the and both bryology bryology and and lichens the 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 science is going it's very active and and um, phylogeny is being reconsidered and. Um, uh, the names are changing all the time. It's a moving target. <clears throat> so the, the names in that book are dated, but um, it's still, I mean, excellent, very approachable book. Um, yeah, and then they are working on a new edition, but that'll be a few years, I think. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that recently we really discovered that the yeast is a component there. Any thoughts about what the yeast is doing hanging out there, but this function might be? I don't know. I think it was located in the cortex. Um, just, I don't know. It made that structure stronger or something. Um, I still haven't read that article. I, I, I need to go down to my university library and it, it's such a high profile journal, you know, you just can't get at the article. Uh, so, yes. Um, in terms of like that, Interaction between species. There are a lot of study on the community and ecology. Yes, yes. Um, lots. Um, I should know more about this. I'm more of a taxonomist. I just like to know what it is. And um, I have learned some ecology of them over the years, but not as much as I, I should, maybe. Um, yeah, like in communities. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I'm, sorry, I'm blanking out right now. I can't think of any um, examples, but um, I mean, there are suites of lichens that are unique to the coast and the mountains and in the valley and things like that. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, interactions with other types of you know, what we're planting that. Like at the most Arctic area, they know for being reindeer food or any interactions like that in our region. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Then the Arctic, uh, the yeah, the interactions with animals and lichens and or bryophytes is um, especially the lichens up there is a really big deal or very significant. Um, down here, some examples that come to mind are Bryoria, I think the the horsehair lichen. If you go up in the mountains, that's the dark brown stringy lichens um, that can be used for nesting material for small mammals, uh, probably birds too. The birds also use that uh, that very first lichen we saw, uh, <clears throat> the parmelia, they'll put that around the outside of their nests. Um, it's got these little risings that um, probably bind some of their grass and stuff together, their other building materials. Um, the spotted, you know, the marbled mirrorlet. There's a, the there's a epiphytic moss that grows high up in um well, it grows all over, but it, it can also grow high up in old growth conifers where the the conifers are so old that the the limbs are big and broad, so broad that the epiphytic moss on it 
all that the marbled mural it needs is to kind of find a space that big and kind of make a divot and that's its nest. It's the, the, uh, that species would be Anatrichia curtipendula, uh, pleurocarpus moss, which is a big wiry, big pleurocarpus moss up there, carpet. Yes. Yeah. Three questions from Zoom. Okay. <clears throat> uh, from Pete Gonzalez. Do same species of fungus occur with and without symbiotes? Right. Um, good question. Um, I don't think so. I mean, you can't say never in biology. Because there's always an exception, but the rule of thumb is, is I, they, when living, the fungus, a lichen fungus living by itself without the symbiont has not occurred. And they have a hard time creating that in the lab. They have, and it looks like this pale glob. It's amorphous, small glob. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, there's, you know, kind of a synergistic effect when the, those two organisms come together and, and make a whole un, uh, unique structure that didn't, doesn't exist without either one of them. Um, Pete also asked, how important is ChemKid for Keen? Pretty important. Um, yes. Um, one of the chemicals is bleach. So you can, that's your C test. Um, so you just get plain old bleach, um, not, not anything with the uh, lemon scent or whatever, so bleach. And then the other one is pit... <sighs> sodium. sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. I, I, think I should know this. I feel like I'm on TV and I'm, I'm, I'm failing. Um, anyway, it's the K test and that's really, important too. And um, that, that's not as easy to find, but um, I don't know, you can get a lot of things online. And then there's a P-test and that's that's uh, carcinogenic. So you have to be very careful when you use it. Um, you can get away without using it for a lot of stuff, but if you get serious, then you can track down some people. Yeah. Important. Yeah. Um, and then Maya Black asked, could Dave please repeat which rare species was documented on Samson Creek? Um, Pseudocrocidium horns chuchianum. <laughs> <laughs> it was Sam, is it not Samson Creek? Yes, not yeah. Pete. Yeah. Yep. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone comes in. Okay. Maybe everyone in the room. And one more question. Oh, okay, one yes. more question. The pan section, the, the pin sections, yes. the lamina. Mm -hmm. You make this by hand. Yes. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a lot of practice. And um, yeah, well, it, the technique is under a dissecting scope. You get your specimen there. Um, if it's a moss, I usually take a dry the tip of a dry shoot, put it there and take a dissecting needle and put it perpendicular to it, um, kind of towards the up tip of the shoot and then hold that down. And then I got my razor blade and I just um, go like this and I just barely roll the pin back um, as I do that. And then you, you get those. Um, yeah, take some practice, but it's good. And then a uh, sharp razor blade helps. It's one of those things where usually you just need skill. And, and if you go buy an expensive piece of equipment, it, it doesn't do you any good. You just need the skill. But this, the sharp razor blade really does help. So. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.